and Albemarle County. We want advocates for equity, inclusion, and mobility justice to have access to resources they can use to build political will for change, a strong and diverse coalition of organizations and government agencies to implement an ambitious and achievable action plan, state and local transportation agencies to incorporate accessibility and walkability audits into their planning and design processes, and accessibility standards to be adopted in the region to improve conditions for people with disabilities and everyone else. Here is the uh, series of webinars. Uh, this is number three, Mobility Justice, Prioritizing Investment in Disadvantaged Communities. I will mention that webinars one and two have been recorded, are available on YouTube. Um, I'll be sending out the link to this webinar as well as the first two uh, by the end of the week. And the fourth webinar to be held next Wednesday will also be recorded. So this entire collection will be available for review afterwards. So we're going to be focusing on the concept of equity today, um, which is generally defined as being providing the resources to the individuals, um, communities and places that need them the most, as illustrated in this in this graphic here. And by allocating resources and investments and support and assistance in this way, we're acknowledging that uh, people are starting from different places, that people have different needs. Some people have more needs than others. And we're using a principle around we want everybody to thrive. And in order to do though that, the people who um, have the most challenges and barriers, for whatever reason, uh, should receive the assistance that they need. So here's an example of uh, people that uh, need some assistance in terms of accessibility and mobility. This is actually um, a bridge carrying Interstate 70 over Quebec Street in Denver, Colorado. Um, on one side of the interstate, uh, there are a number of uh, businesses, hotels, uh, fast food restaurants, um, gas stations, um, and on the other side of the highway is a uh, low-income housing development, and many of the people who work at those businesses live in that particular housing development. And until recently, a couple of years ago, this was literally the best option that people had for their commute to work if they didn't own a car, which many of them didn't. Um, fortunately, I'm happy to say that as the result of advocacy efforts uh, in by, by groups in Denver, uh, this, uh, this bridge has been rebuilt and now has a very safe and smooth and wide sidewalk connecting the two sides of the interstate uh, so that people can travel easily and safely uh, between uh, the, the subdivision and the business district. We know, as we've uh, discussed earlier in this series, that conditions for people with disabilities are lacking in many, many parts of most American towns and cities. There are not smooth uh, pathways. Public transit is uh, um, has inadequate service to make life easy. Um, America Walks runs a, a an annual campaign called um, Week Without Driving, where we encourage public officials to go a week without driving or go a few days without driving uh, and, and live that experience in their own community. And we know from what we've heard from those participants that uh, it, it has an impact on people understanding how much more investment is needed in improving conditions for access and mobility for people with disabilities 
um, as, as well as for many other groups, uh, particularly people who don't have access to a car. Here we see conditions for many low-income people in different parts of the country, where if you don't have a car and you're walking or biking or trying to get to public transit in order to get where you need to go, whether that's getting to work, taking your child to daycare, um, you have to contend with very unsafe freeways and highways and a lack of pedestrian infrastructure. This is particularly true in tribal and rural areas where pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure has, has never been prioritized. And if you don't have a car and you live in those places, uh, you are left with uh, very difficult and dangerous conditions. And this particular slide showing the goat path uh, there uh, is evidence that on a daily basis, residents of this area are crossing a very high speed and dangerous um, uh, divided highway. And uh, maybe if they're doing that during the day and they have good eyesight and judgment, they are able to do so safely. But we know from the statistics that many people are hit and killed or seriously injured in these kind of situations while trying to cross a highway, especially in the twilight and darkness hours. And it's not just in tribal and rural areas. It happens in the suburbs as well, where there are um, major arterials without any safe way to get across. Um, this was a tragic story um, 13 years ago now. Uh, Raquel Nelson, um, a, a working single mother, arrived home on the bus. She had to get across the highway to get home and tragically uh, with, with her son and, and her son was killed. And with just cruel irony, she was charged with vehicular homicide and criminal jaywalking in the death of her son when she was trying to do the best that she could and dealing with infrastructure that was utterly unsupportive. Um, I am pleased to say that those charges were eventually dropped after an outcry, but this is indicative of how our system works against people who have all kinds of inherent disadvantages. We also know that the way our transportation system is policed is very uh, unequal. Um, these data show, therefore the state of California, show the... Um, uh, relative number of uh, stops by police uh, of, of drivers of different racial and ethnic backgrounds versus their proportion in the community. And in particular, look at the black data. Black people in California are stopped uh, twice as often as their proportion in the community. And Middle Eastern and South Asian people are also stopped at a very high rate. And I'm not going to go into why that is at this point, but want to make out that the lived experience of certain groups moving through their community uh, is, is very difficult. Um, and over-policing in general is something that black and brown people experience all the time, whether they're driving, walking, or bicycling. Um, and... The rule, the law of jaywalking has been proven to be used in a very um, uh, unjust way to uh, harass black and brown people. Again, we have data showing um, the, the disproportions in the way that these laws are used. And in fact, jaywalking has now been uh, outlawed. Uh, or, or rather, the, the 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 law against jaywalking has now been taken off the books in California as a result of some of the um, uh, data and the advocacy in that state. So I want to go back to pedestrian fatalities. Um, this graph shows the number of people killed while walking each year, going back to 2011. Um, it's now well over 7,000 pedestrian fatalities a year. And if we look at how those fatalities are distributed by the median household income of the neighborhood where people live, we can see from this graph that 
Um, if you live in a poor neighborhood, which generally means that you are poor, you are much more at risk for being killed while walking, both because the, the roadway system in those areas is so much less safe. There's so many fewer facilities for pedestrians and bicyclists, and also because in poor neighborhoods, residents are less likely to have access to a personal vehicle. And if we look at the same data now organized by racial and ethnic background, we see that Black and African American residents, as well as American Indian and Alaska Native residents, are also vastly more at risk than uh, the average American. And I'm going to finish this opening slideshow with um, a, a, a specific example of a very intentional um, planning practice that was used and that harmed mostly African-American neighborhoods, but also um, other uh, immigrant and, um, and non-white neighborhoods and communities. Um, this is a redlining map, which, of course, was used to identify the areas where federal loans would not be extended because um, they were uh, African-American predominant neighborhoods. And these maps were used not just for the federal loans program, but also for the federal highway program. And as highways were built into cities in the 1950s and 1960s, their routes were determined uh, very often by where those neighborhoods were. We, those neighborhoods were seen as expendable or possibly even as desirable to be, to be uh, targeted with eminent domain and highway construction. One such neighborhood is the Rondo neighborhood of St. Paul, Minnesota, very close to where I live. In the 1940s and 1950s, it was one of the most successful black neighborhoods in the country and had strong businesses, strong schools, strong churches. 75% um, of the African-American population of St. Paul lived in this one neighborhood. Um, and it was a model, really, even though segregation was still a real thing. However, uh, in the early 1950s, the decision was made that Interstate 94 connecting St. Paul with Minneapolis would be driven directly through the middle of the Rondo neighborhood, uh, right down the main street, so that all of those properties were condemned, were acquired by the government by eminent domain. People were not compensated properly for their property ownership and their land ownership. They were turned off the land. The highway was built and the highway is still there today. Uh, dividing the Rondo neighborhood into two parts. And um, I had hoped that Keith Baker, the executive director of Reconnect Rondo, um, a, an advocacy organization uh, working to repair some of the harms that were done 60, 70 years ago, would be here to tell us about the story of his neighborhood. Unfortunately, he had a conflict and was not able to join us. Um, but I will summarize that the uh, the current Minnesota Department of Transportation is working uh, very cooperatively with Reconnect Rondo. There are a number of plans on the table for um, one of them for creating a land bridge, which would be a cap over the interstate uh, of about quarter of a mile or half a mile in length and building a community park on that and investing in um, other development in the area um, and the current times are more geared towards uh, this equity approach. So I want to um, introduce our um, uh, panelists for today's discussion and then we'll be doing a quick live poll. Amar Sid is the Deputy Director of Community Investments and Planning with the California Strategic Growth Council. Hosky Banali Jr., who is uh, here on the phone, uh, so I've just put his picture up there so you know what Hosky looks like, is the Community and Government Liaison with the Native American Disability Law Center, and he's also a member of the uh, U.S. President's National Council on Disability. And Garrett Brumfield, many of you know from previous uh, webinars and workshops, uh, is the founder of Overcome Yours. 
But before we meet the panelists, um, I'd like you all to take a look at this question. And uh, and Rachel is going to put up the poll. I will stop my screen share in just a second. Um, in terms of access to safe mobility, do you experience or observe discrimination? And we're giving you four options. I want you just to pick one of those that you feel applies most uh, closely to your experience or your observations. I'll just leave that up there for a second. Um, but now I'm going to stop my screen share. And there is the poll. Um, thank you very much, Rachel, for popping that up. And we'll just give people um, a few seconds. Uh, so it looks as if we have 30 participants in the webinar at the moment. Um, a little over half of you have responded to the survey. And uh, we'll just give it another minute or so. Uh, Rachel, am I correct that at the moment the poll results are not visible to the webinar participants? I believe that's correct. Okay, thank you. I can mm -hmm. see that, but uh, uh, we'll just wait and see. I think maybe just about everybody has who's going to complete the poll has. So uh, do you want to go ahead and share it, uh, Rachel, so everyone can see the poll? Uh, so go. we thank you. Um, so we have just just one or two people selecting. Um, I am not aware of any discrimination. And at the other extreme, this type of discrimination is my daily lived experience. The majority uh, have selected a failure to recognize the needs of certain groups impacts me and or people I know. Uh, and, and the second highest uh, number of, um, of votes came for past injustices created conditions which are harmful to me and or people I know today. So with that, um, if you would like to stop sharing the, uh, the poll there, please, Rachel. And I would like to move to our panel. Now, at the time that we started, um, our first panelist, uh, Amar Sid, uh, had not joined. Amar, are, are you here now? Oh yes, I've been I've been on. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, great. So Amar, I want to start with you. If you want to uh, put your camera on, um, I'd like Amar, if you would, to uh, you to tell us about yourself, uh, your family, uh, your family background, and the story of your neighborhood. Thank you, Amar. Right. Hi, everybody. My camera's on. Can you can you see me? Yes, we can okay. see. Okay, awesome. Um, hi again, my name is Amara Susana Sid. I'm the Deputy Director for Community Investments and Planning at the California Strategic Growth Council. We are an office within the governor's office. Um, wanted to just kind of say that because maybe interesting on, on why I'm in this space and how I know Ian. Um, my background is primarily in transportation, primarily in transit, and then the latter half of my transportation background is um in equity or was in equity in developing um, and launching the first equity office within a state DOT. So my background, I was born and raised in Sacramento, California. Um, I identify as an indigenous person, Yaki Yoemi and uh, Chicana, um, Mexican-American. My family um, is an interesting mix of um, third, fourth, fifth generation, as well as um, immigrant populations um, to, to California. Um, family settled in Sacramento, and I had this great opportunity to be raised in close-knit community. With that said, um, how I was raised was very much in a lens and a construct of social justice, civil rights. Both my parents were active in the Chicano indigenous movements. Uh, my mother was from San Diego, California, where her community um, in Badia Logan was decimated by um, the H Highway 5, as well as the Coronado Bridge. Um, through her activism, she was a co-founder of Chicano Park, which became a community-led effort to build a park underneath the freeway um, and, and essentially reclaim that land for community um, and 
part of it was they had several pedestrian deaths in the community, uh, primarily youth that were playing in the streets. They had been promised a park um, and the park was not actually going to be made. They were going to change it into a substation of sorts. And so they took it over, um, reclaimed that land. Um, and I say that because that is, is the lens that I have uh, been raised in of, of thinking about some of the injustices that are placed uh, upon our communities. The community that I was raised in was Oak Park, California, and this particular community was predominantly Black. Um, when I was born and raised in the 80s and 90s, um, it also had a large Hmong population and uh, Mexican-American population throughout the 90s and early 2000s. I say this community because this community was the first suburb of Sacramento. This community had a very um, thriving business district, um, had a really awesome, um, I would say, uh, streetcar. It had a lot of opportunity for, for folks to thrive here. And it did become um, one of the, the largest um, Black communities um, throughout the 40s, 50s, and 60s. In that time, it was also then um, designated where the Highway 99 would come in as well as Highway F uh, 50 would come in. Those two freeways, again, decimated um, the business districts and large swaths of the community, um, essentially cutting off the community from the downtown area and from any of the business networks that were east and or west of this particular area. So from the 50s, 60s and on, we had a lack of investment. We had heavy over-policing in the 80s and 90s and into the 2000s. Um, infrastructure investments were non-existent in my community. Growing up, um, I would recognize that communities just across the freeway um, had sidewalks that were repaved every other year. They were putting in um, pedestrian humps and bump, speed bumps in the streets, stop signs, my community didn't have any of that. Um, and it was still part of the city proper, couldn't figure out why this was happening. Um, over policing, stop and frisk spaces, and a lot of pedestrian um, rates of injury on our streets and harm, um, and if not death. And so I started questioning at a young age, why? Why is this happening? Why don't we have certain things in our community um, I played in the street, played baseball in the street all the time, having to kind of dodge um, cars. It was unsafe to go to our parks. And um, I believe around eight or nine, I wrote a letter to our city council members asking why we don't have stop signs. Why don't we don't, why don't we have speed bumps? Um, and I literally compared to other streets um, just on the other side of that freeway. This street has it. I don't see you know, that rate of, of kid activity in those streets. Why, do, why doesn't our streets have that? About five years later, we did get some, some speed bumps. Um, and that I think sent the trajectory of how I wanted to operate as an adult. I went to, mm -hmm. to school thinking about planning, thinking about how we are connected, how are we disconnected, how we were bifurcated um, by certain policies. And it led me through policy and planning framework. Um, and again, I say this because these are, um, things that help me go into the spaces where I am in today of thinking about community investments, thinking about how communities have really been disinvested for a long time, have been historically harmed and continuously harmed by that lack of investment today, and thinking about what are the benefits that communities like, like mine, communities like you know other communities like Rondo um, were missing and, and how our lives may have been changed if we didn't have our communities um, bifurcated by freeway systems or lack of investments. And um, I, I think the critical space that we're in today, um, especially within the last few year, five years where we talk about um, disadvantaged communities, talking about community investments, talking about equity, um, we have a space and, and a, an opportunity to really see how our investments um, help address some of the issues, help address and atone for, for some of the, the lack of investments over the last several decades, it, it won't actually really change much if we're not also recognizing the policy implications that we still need to, to, to really ratify. Um, but I think that's the charge I have in this space and excited um, to continue working with that thread throughout my career. Great. Thank you, Amar. And we want to come back to your present day work as models for how um, other communities, other cities, other government agencies should be working. I'd like to now move and uh, introduce Hosky Banali Jr. Um, Hosky, 
Um, can you tell us about your lived experience of mobility and safety in your community in the Navajo Nation? And Husky, we're not hearing you. You're muted. At oh, Rachel, uh, can you unmute Husky? Husky, I'm guessing you can hear me. Rachel, is it possible um, that Husky uh, has to unmute himself or? Yeah, so I've, I'm asked to unmute. Okay. And Husky has a visual impairment and may not be able to do that. Husky, um, if you, oh, here we go. Okay, go ahead, Husky. Tell us about your lived experience. Okay. Yeah, I'm Husky Manali Jr. Um, with the Navajo Nation. I'm located near Four Corners Monument where Utah, Arizona, and Mexico, and Colorado come together. I'm just about 30 miles east of there. Um, I grew up here in, in the community. Um, and uh, I've uh, been in the disability arena now since 19... 77 and so there's a lot of uh things that need to be done here on the navajo nation in regards to disability rights um where i'm located um is a small community and from the there's a there's a highway state highway coming from the north side from Colorado. Colorado is probably only about 15 to 20 miles north of us. Then there's another highway that comes through our community from the west side, and that's from Arizona. And that's probably about 30 miles from Arizona. Then there's another interstate, or not interstate, but a state highway that comes from us, comes to us on the south side. Um, and then from the east side, there's another, so where like intersections, there's one, two, two main intersections. And, um, we, uh, because of the, where we're, how we're located, there's a lot of, um, semi trucks coming through, um, on their way to delivering whatever their product is. So we have a lot of semis coming through on a daily basis. So you know how these semi trucks are sometimes they just uh think they own the highway. And so um we're in a situation here we do have sidewalks, um, but um we have a four four lane highway and they have traffic lights. But it's very dangerous, in my opinion, for people with disabilities, you know, walker or or somebody, a uh, wheelchair user or a blind person like myself, to cross these streets. Um, and so this is kind of like the way it is across Indian country, a lot of communities. Here on the Navajo Nation, a lot of the small communities right down the center are state highways with um, businesses on each side or housing areas. And so we face this on a on a daily basis. And I'm thinking that is probably pretty common through Indian country. Um, one of the things that... Um, we have not really looked at is the safety issue, how it affects the community. You know, there's a, I've seen a lot of surveys being done, mostly on disability in the area of health or in the ability and and with education, those kind of surveys. But I haven't seen a survey where we're talking specifically about 
traffic safety. And I think um, this is something that um, needs to be brought forth. I think mm-hmm. until something is, is documented in that area of how prevalent it is, then people will start paying attention. But right now it isn't. Um, Thank you. Like, Great. Th- okay, thank you. Go. Yeah. Thank you, Hosky, for those opening comments. Um, I will be coming back again, but now I want to um, welcome Garrett Brumfield. And Garrett, can you go ahead and share your story um, and tell us a little bit about what you've learned and how you're using that knowledge in your work? Absolutely. Thank you, Ian. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Garrett Brumfield. I'm coming to you from Virginia. Um, I am a person with a disability living with cerebral palsy, and currently I use a mobility scooter to get uh, from point A to point B mostly. Uh, I live in the downtown Roanoke area of, um, <clears throat> of Virginia, and it's a small community, a small downtown area. Um, and the thing that I've learned in that, and, and which has shaped my advocacy, is that. You know, there are many injustices in terms of stream. Garrett, I'm, I'm just going to interrupt. We, we have we have that distortion on your audio line, which we had once before. I don't know if there was a setting you changed or or something that you did to. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, shoot. Um, Garrett, do you want to phone in on your phone using the Zoom phone number? And I suspect that will solve the problem. Move to the next. Uh, yeah, we'll move on, and then I'll come back to you when I see you uh, sure. come back in. Sure. Um, okay, so I, I, I want to move to um, another question, kind of a two-part question, um, and. Um, Husky, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with you this time. Um, why, in your view, should society or government prioritize investment in disadvantaged disadvantaged communities, and how do we go about achieving that outcome? Okay. Um... We on the Navajo Nation and probably other Indian countries, um, we get caught between federal funding, state funding, and then our own tribal funding. And there seems to be lack of coordination to address any kind of disability issue. Um, But like I said earlier, I don't think that some, anybody has really looked at this issue and come up with some documentation of how prevalent it is and and that people find out what the community really thinks about the situation um, because it doesn't only affect, affect people with disabilities, but it affects the elders and it affects um, veterans with disabilities. And so it's just something that needs to be brought to the forefront. Um, President Clinton back in 2000 put out an executive order 13175 to have um, the uh, federal executive branch have meaningful consultation with Indian country regarding disability issues. And then that didn't go very far until Biden, um, President Biden came in and he reissued that same executive order. But being on the National Council on Disabilities, that's one of the things that um, the council is trying to address. Mm -hmm. So right now we're doing uh, surveys, focus groups to see if we can fulfill that executive order. But again, in looking at some of the questions and the focus groups, it, it doesn't even mention about traffic safety. And so it needs to be brought to the forefront somehow. Right. 
Thank you very much, Hosky. Um, Amar, same question for you. Why should we prioritize investment in disadvantaged communities and how do we go about this? I think that's the question folks are trying to solve all the time. Um, and I think we've had some really good momentum over the last decade in, in some of our investments um, benefiting communities. In California, I'll speak from my experience here. Um, I've worked on the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund programs since the inception. Um, so yeah, a decade, 2004, um, in transportation programs. And in that legislation um, that really breathed re light into the, the programs that came out of this fund, um, it was in partnership with advocates across the state um, to see these funds actually benefiting communities that are most impacted by pollution, have um, socioeconomic conditions um, overlaid with pollution areas. And so we, we came up with a mapping tool um, called Cal Enviro Screen. Um, we took in several you know, different areas to consider on how we think about disadvantaged communities. So from that regard, um, it was actually the first state platform that we were starting to utilize to identify um, mostly pollution burden communities um, and seeing how our funds could actually um, improve those conditions. And I, I mentioned advocates here because they helped with the legislation and they put in language that called out direct and meaningful benefit when we called, the, uh, called out how these investments were gonna land with community. And that direct meaningful benefit language, I think for me has gone a long way where in the past we have a lot of programs and finance structures that come out and we talk about um, environmental justice, but we don't really get into the nitty gritty of, of how these funds are actually gonna quote unquote benefit a community. And if it's a direct and meaningful benefit, um, this was a very big challenge um, in the first, I would say five years of this program because folks also said, hey, um, if I'm initiating a transportation pro project, um, it's my right, I put in a project, there's a benefit because it increases access. Um, but it was walking folks back and thinking about, did you connect with the folks that are most impacted? Did they communicate that this is something that they want, that they need? Um, and finding a way to articulate that in your application so that it's not just something that we're giving to local entities to, you know, to put in uh, new routes or new bike lanes. We want to have those routes, bike lanes, or any any transportation investment actually land well with community that are most impacted. And so it was backing up um, quite a bit of one identifying those disadvantaged communities through a mapping tool. Not the best place, not the the best option when you think about transportation and people because we're fluid, right? We move from place to place. Um, but was a starting ground, and then that language of directing the meaningful benefit called out and called us in to actually get into um, documenting how these projects were going to benefit and then that evaluation please did these actually benefit um, and so it started to restructure a lot of our, our applicants in a way where they had to do community engagement um, they could no longer just put up a public meeting notes notice they had to actually do meaningful engagement with community and we did create um, benefit criteria tables so um, tools on how to actually get to direct and meaningful benefit. And we did it in a way where um, for certain transportation projects or any of the investments called out what, what community advocates and, and policymakers thought was the, the path to that engagement process. Um, and so that's, that's one way that we've done that in California for the last 10 years. Um, in the Strategic Growth Council where, where I'm at right now, We've had two programs that piloted funds from the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, now rebranded into um, California Climate Investments. Uh, my portfolio is community investments and planning. And these programs, um, again, birth out of advocacy after the first couple of years of, of how these, these, these funds were landing, we're really thinking about, hey, um, we're trying to address a multitude of concerns, um, primarily climate related uh, over pollution burdened communities, but not all of these communities have the tools and uh, the capacity to engage in all of the available funding that is out there. Why, why are we not treating this more holistically? How do we come up with 
funding mechanisms that um, are really geared towards the community level or the person. Um, and so we have one program called the Transformative Climate Communities that is more like a block level funding program that um, is looking at the most impacted communities, having them create community benefit agreements, community partnership structure, and work that partnership structure through the life of these investments. And these are large scale investments, okay. upwards of $35 million that um, are really tying the community together with a lead applicant and maybe about 12 um, partner applicants that are doing um, pedestrian infrastructure, housing, affordable housing, water, urban greening, trees, have a huge component of workforce development and anti-displacement um, and a whole host of other things. Um, but this is one way that we started piloting in California on braiding opportunities together to address whole community needs, right? I think many of us on here, um, you know, live a life where we need transportation, we need quality transportation, we need quality food, right? And you wouldn't just say, hey, I'm only going to give you this to meet something that you may think about, but it may not be the immediate need. And so that's how we're thinking about backing up our level of funding to, to really prioritize um, disadvantaged communities or what we call priority populations in the state. Um, and then we also have several different edicts now um, that are more intentional on tribal investments, tribal consultation, um, and, and treating tribes as um, and elevating their sovereignty within the state of California. Um, and so those are all ways that we're starting to identify and address um, communities um, that are burdened, well, but also strategizing opportunities um, all the time to-, to what, I'm, what I'm hearing is meaningful engagement and connecting the dots from a lot of different types of services and, and needs. Um, so Correct. Thank you very much for sharing yeah. your work, uh, Amar. Garrett, back to you. Hopefully we have clearer audio now. Um, yeah, tell us uh, in your view why we should be investing, prioritizing in uh, disadvantaged communities and some things that you've seen that are effective in doing that. Hey everybody, hopefully you can hear me better now. I'll keep yeah, my much better. I'll keep my remarks brief since I know we're, we're on a time crunch, but um, yeah, the main reason, um, to invest in people with disabilities and the disability community is because the fact is that anyone, that is a community that anyone can join at any time. No, that's not a threat or anything like that, but I mean, everyone experiences challenges in their lives that, you know, dictate their health and, and, and their own well being. And, um, and, so, you know, like and everyone, whether a disability impacts you, your loved one, your friends, your family, everyone has uh, some story, some experience of that. And we must remember that if we make society more accessible and equitable for people with disabilities and other marginalized communities, then it benefits everyone. Mm -hmm. like, I mean, think about it like this. If, if we have more ramps, more curb cuts, not only does that help me as a person with a mobility scooter, but it also helps someone on the sidewalk that might be moving from place to place in need, in need of a ramp. Or, you know, a uh, um, 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 mother or father pushing a, a baby stroller. You know, anything, like, any number of things like that. Um, some good examples um some some good examples of, of how to do that is to is to be willing to support by 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 providing adaptations, portable ramps, push buttons for crosswalks, audible signals for crosswalks. Um, if 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 a store in a downtown area is not accessible, you know, have some way to to make it accessible. Maybe a phone number to call, or or a push button so that someone can get support, to be able to. Uh, to be able to uh, access the store also in downtown areas uh, to have um, fixed barriers so that barriers don't blockade the sidewalks um, you know because sometimes if there are movable barriers then they often get pushed way too far out into the sidewalk and, and make things uh, more challenging so do those lamp scooters and such so i'll i'll leave it right there range of um, low tech and higher tech and regulatory and non-regulatory interventions can help and keeping the issue of investing in disadvantaged 
communities front of mind is the way to ensure that we keep making progress. Thank you, panelists. We're going to go to a very brief breakout session. Um, we'll literally do, I think we'll say eight minutes, um, Rachel. Um, I do want to just note that um, Peter Krebs pointed out that uh, um, jaywalking has been decriminalized in the state of Virginia as well as California. So thank you for that. Um, and the two questions that you'll be discussing in the breakout groups, firstly, in what ways do you see equity in action, prioritizing resources where there is the greatest need in your own organization or in the community? And then secondly, what ideas do you have for emphasizing mobility justice in the upcoming action plan that we're going to be developing? All right, welcome back. We'll just give folks a few seconds to for everyone to uh, to make it back. Um, and, um, I, I will check in with room facilitators. Thanks so much to those of you. Uh, Timothy, uh, AARP Virginia, let me go to you first. Um, what what responses did you get to the questions about observations of equity in action and ideas for our upcoming planning process? Yeah, so uh, our group focused a lot on uh, issues of climate justice, which was actually a unique perspective that I had never even considered um, and talked about how there's needs for increased like uh, foliage coverage, tree coverage, make it more comfortable to be able to walk um, through various neighborhoods. And then there was a lot of discussion as well with the bike ped advisory committees um, that Charlottesville Auburn will have. Um, and then this also led into how we can um, improve mobility justice through uh, improving coordination amongst all these various entities that seem to be working in this lane, but may not be actually working together in this lane. And mm -hmm. so how do we improve that coordination and sharing of resources, et cetera, to actually make up an impact? Great. Thank you, Timothy. Some some great ideas there. Uh, Sue Friedman, uh, Charlottesville Area Alliance, you were leading one of the groups. What, what did you all talk about? Yes, we had a very robust group, a lot of good ideas. Um, to the first issue, how do you see equity in action? And uh, was noted from um, Delia that that the city of Winchester hasn't been negatively impacted by I-80, but that it's still there and between the city and the county. And that is equity, not in action. So there are a lot of uh, conversations going on about that. Um, connecting neighborhoods with pedestrian and bicycle opportunities um, and helping communities be more pedestrian friendly. Um, one of the issues that came up several times is funding. Um, is pedestrian and bike friendly last if there are even funds available? So that was uh, never enough funding. Um, the city's evaluation of infrastructure impediments has been a good start, we think, and need to continue that and look at things like utility poles and how they get in the way of pedestrian and bike friendly, housing development, social justice, um, thinking about children as we're building things. Um, as someone said, Albrecht said, we know how to look left and right and children may not be well versed in that. So again, um, and I think um, Amid brought it up clearly, go to those who live there, go to those who are going to be using that infrastructure and get their input. And um, the new issues that need to be taken up, um, Hosky said, always, you know, take advantage of looking at the ADA and surveying the community based on the ADA and, um, you know, knowing what it is you need to do going forward. And we barely got started on uh, what do we need to do for emphasizing mobility justice, but already we know it's a combination of thoroughly engaging everyone whoever they might be as a user or potential user and also funding 
yeah. funding. And I, I think uh, a theme is that real, authentic, meaningful uh, community engagement can go a really long way because we've done such a poor job of it historically. Uh, we're, we're at time, but Garrett, can you give us a quick report out from, from your room and then we will wrap up? Sure. Um, just very quickly, uh, um, some other things that have not been said. Um, utilizing things like Wheel the World, which is which is a way to to see how accessible you know your areas are for 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 hospitality and and for uh, attractions and things like that. Um, just getting people out in the community themselves, um, as opposed to just making plans, figuring out who else needs to be at the table, um, and you know figuring out how to. Um, you know, prevent the next vehicular uh, fatality, improving systems. Um, yeah, great. That's good idea. Well, thanks very much, everybody. Appreciate the presenters, the room facilitators. Uh, next week, we are having an extended session. It'll be an hour and a half, so we won't be quite so pushed for time. And the the small group discussions will focus on some structured questions designed to build up our um, uh, our Charlottesville and Albemarle County uh, community action plan yes. forward to address equity and accessibility in the area. Uh, I hope to see you all then. Thanks very much and have Thank a great you. Thank you, everyone.